the sights and sounds of camp, a place for renewal and recreation, a place for refuge and retreating, a place where God, nature, and you meet, and your life is forever changed. But what if this change is not positive? What if this change actually becomes an awful memory because you or someone you know experienced a sexually abusive encounter with someone you thought you could trust? Well, this hour-long training video, which includes both instruction and time for discussion and review, will help all who watch. So let's get started. The purpose of this training video is to provide all staff, counselors, volunteers, and church leadership with a clear understanding of how to recognize symptoms, reduce situations, and report sexual abuse or molestation while at camps. You see, prevention is a priority for the protection and safety of our children, our churches, and our camps. This video is divided into four segments with a time for review at the end of each segment. Take time to discuss and review statements or questions before advancing to the next segment. The segments are the definitions and effects of sexual abuse and child molestation, typical patterns and methods of operation of a child molester, signs, symptoms, and reporting of suspected sexual abuse, recommended procedures to reduce prevent and report suspected abuse or molestation of campers. In this first segment, we will define and identify sexual abuse and the effects of child abuse. The precise legal definition of child sexual abuse or molestation well, it varies from state to state, but in general, it includes any form of sexual abuse to which a minor is being used for the sexual stimulation of the perpetrator. In this training, the terms molestation and sexual abuse are used interchangeably. From the Texas Administrative Code, child, a person under 18 years of age who is not and has not been married or who has not had the disabilities of minority removed for general purposes. Sexual abuse, any sexual activity, including any involuntary or non-consensual sexual conduct that would constitute an offense under the Penal Code 21.08 or Chapter 22, involving a facility and a patient or client. Sexual activity includes, but is not limited to, kissing, hugging, stroking or fondling with sexual intent, oral sex or sexual intercourse, and request, suggestion, or encouragement for the performance of sex. Child sexual abuse may be violent or nonviolent. Here are some types of child abuse. Physical abuse includes bodily harm or injury caused by blows or harmful substances, as well as exposure to unreasonable risk of harm or injury. Emotional and psychological maltreatment attacks a child's self-image, often through labels and ridicule. Neglect is the failure to provide for a child's physical, medical, emotional, and safety needs. Sexual abuse can occur through showing and communicating, as well as through touching. Not only forced activity, but also permission and persuasion can be abusive. Non-touching sexual abuse offenses include Touching sexual offenses include Other types of abuse, abandonment and threats of harm. Child sexual abuse or molestation is criminal behavior that involves children and sexual behaviors for which they are not personally, socially, and developmentally ready. Studies by child development experts have stated 
Abuse and neglect may affect children's physical, cognitive, emotional, and social development, resulting in aggressiveness, anxiousness, the inability to control emotions, depression, and learning difficulties, among other problems. It goes on to say victims of child abuse often suffer from inability to trust, which leads to problems in relationships, feelings of guilt, anger, and low self-esteem, a tendency towards alcohol and drug abuse, eating disorders, suicidal thoughts, and suicide. These effects continue long after the abuse has stopped, even into adulthood. Victims of child abuse also tend to engage in criminal activity at a higher rate than the general population, more likely than others to engage in risky sexual behavior. However, the greatest loss to society comes from lost innocence, lost hope, lost joy, lost potential. But in the life of a child, it may mean loss of faith and trust in God. In this segment, we will instruct how to avoid being accused of sexual abuse or molestation, how to prevent camper-on-camper -camper abuse, and how to report sexual abuse or molestation. Perhaps the greatest challenge to persons choosing to work with children and youth in Christian camping is when one suspects sexual abuse or child molestation or when one confides that they have been abused or molested. The following policies are primarily for the protection of campers. However, they also serve to protect adult counselors from false accusations of abuse. Two, counselor supervision. No adult will be allowed to be alone with a camper in an isolated place. In situations that require personal conferences, the meeting is to be conducted in view of other adults. No child or teenager is to sit in the lap of an adult. No adult is to allow a child or teenager to sit in his or her lap or lie in his or her bed. The only exception would be the parent of the child. No frontal hugs. An adult from time to time may sense the child's need for a hug in order to support or comfort the child. The adult must use a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder hug. Respect of privacy. Adults must respect the privacy of all campers in situations such as changing clothes or taking showers. An adult would only intrude to the extent that the health and or safety of the camper would be in question. Sleeping accommodations. Adults should sleep in an area where the highest level of supervision is possible and should not isolate themselves from general view. Appropriate attire. Adults will at all times dress modestly. Roughhousing or hazing is prohibited. An adult will not wrestle, tickle, or in any way engage a child or teenager in an activity where the adult's hands might come in contact with the camper inappropriately. Please note, all counselors must monitor each other, not to accuse, but to protect each other in case of an allegation. Campers assigned to a counselor should be accounted for at all times. Campers in sleeping areas. Campers will not be permitted to be in the sleeping area of any camper of the opposite sex. Camper visibility. No campers are allowed to be alone with another camper out of sight of an adult or other campers. Sleeping assignments. Campers are to sleep in his or her assigned bed. Campers are not to sleep together. Adult supervision. Adults are to supervise all activities of the camper, both organized and unorganized. Supervision during swim activities. Close supervision by adults during all swim activities is mandatory. Older campers. Older campers who tend to spend a great deal of time with younger campers should be encouraged to engage in activities with their own appropriate age group. Reporting by a camper. When a camper reports a situation that makes him or her uncomfortable, the counselor must take action to protect the camper. The adult who has witnessed or who becomes aware of any form of abuse of a camper must inform the youth camp license operator as soon as possible. Investigation of allegations. Counselors are not to investigate the allegations. Counselors are to report the information to
to the youth camp licensed operator as soon as possible. Reporting. The counselor is to submit to the youth camp licensed operator a written report of how he or she gained the knowledge of the allegation within 24 hours. State reporting. The youth camp licensed operator is to report by phone followed by fax to the Department of State Health Services, Environmental Health Group. If the abuse happens on the campus of the Texas Youth Camp, it must also be reported by the licensed youth camp operator to the Office of General Counsel Investigation Section. When a child or a teenager confides in you, assure him or her that you care, that you're listening, and will do whatever is necessary to be of help. It is not your role to question or determine the facts or to suggest that he or she was or was not abused. Let them know how much you admire the courage and confidence it took to share what has happened. This concludes the child protection training video. The purpose of you viewing this video is to provide safety and protection of our children, churches, and camps. In this segment, we will identify typical patterns and methods of operation of child molesters. A child molester is described as a person older than the victim, male or female, which experiences any type of sexual act with a child. The majority of child molesters are male. Who is the typical child molester? Often camps, churches, and communities fall victim to the stranger danger misconception by believing that molesters are dirty old men or strangers in trench coats. These stereotypes are not only inaccurate, but dangerous, as they allow a false sense of security. Often the public becomes obsessed with the stereotype, while never suspecting that the real molester might be a respected member of the church, camp staff, or community. There are two types of child molesters, preferential offenders and situational offenders. Preferential offenders have a particular sexual preference for children of a particular age, gender, or a child with specific physical characteristics. Extremely dangerous because of their predatory nature. Proactive in seeking their victim and aggressively engage in bold and repeated attempts to molest a child. Invest significant amounts of time, energy, money, and other resources to fulfill their sexual desires. Have excessive interest in children, seek access to children, and frequently move to avoid capture. May maintain pornographic collections and photograph children and or their victims. This type of offender may appear to be the ideal children's or youth worker. They enjoy children. They socialize well among children. The best way to stop this kind of offender is to develop an environment that puts the offender at risk, not the child. A thorough screening program, proper supervision, and accountability will discourage this type of an offender. Situational offenders. Far more situational offenders exist in society than preferential offenders, but they have fewer victims. Situational offenders are opportunists engaging in misconduct when the opportunity presents itself. Are indiscriminate concerning whom they molest and act completely on impulse. An example of a situational offender would be a youth worker who plans various activities for his youth. After the meeting, he takes several of the students home. The last person to be dropped off is a young girl who comes from a dysfunctional family. A pattern develops where the offender and the girl sit in the car and talk for an extended period of time. One thing leads to another. The opportunity presents itself and the youth worker has a sexual relationship with the girl. To reduce the risk of situational molestation, camps must again create an environment of accountability. Screening and supervision are the two key strategies to establish such an environment 
and in turn reduce the risk of sexual molestation. Methods of Operation Sexual predators could employ any of the following methods or strategies to gain access to a child. Seduction The molester usually is known to the child. He spends time with the child and normally is trusted by the child. The initial contact with the child is non-sexual, but over time advances to be sexual in nature. That's a technique called grooming, where the molester offers gifts or favors to gain the trust of the child. Trickery. Molesters are creative in using the natural desires of a child. Children see adults as authoritative figures. Children are naturally curious and need attention and affection. A molester may use these natural tendencies to trick the child into a situation where these molestations can occur. Force. Usually, there is little a child can do to resist force. When force is used, the child is rarely acquainted with the molester. Let's move on to our last method. Secrecy is the common thread in these methods of operation. Secrecy is maintained by several methods. They include, but are not limited to, bribery. This could include gifts, animals, or any favors that interest a child. Blame. The molester tells a child they are at fault for what has happened. Embarrassment. Children realize that what has taken place is wrong. Loss of affection. Often the molester is a person that is loved by the child. Displaced responsibility. The child blames themselves for the molestation. Threats. The molester will threaten the child or someone in the child's family with physical harm. Again, there are two types of offenders, preferential and situational, and they have many different methods of operation. But with proper screening and supervision and accountability, we create an environment that will put the offender at risk and not our children. This segment will teach warning signs and symptoms of sexual abuse or child molestation, recognition of these signs, as well as recommended methods of reporting suspected abuse. Sometimes there may be signs of sexual abuse even if a child or youth does not speak to you directly about it. Uh, there are many symptoms to look for that may indicate that abuse has occurred, especially if more than one symptom is present. Listed are some symptoms that may present themselves in a child or youth that is being sexually abused. These symptoms may be serious indicators of sexual abuse and a person noticing these symptoms should pay particular attention to a child that exhibits them. The presence of any of these behaviors may indicate that sexual abuse has occurred. These behaviors are not, in and of themselves, conclusive evidence that a child has been abused. Did you know? Most children are abused by people they know. Many people are afraid of reporting sexual abuse. Most sexual abuse is probably never reported to the authorities. Possibly one in three cases of child sexual abuse is not remembered by the adults who experienced the abuse. The younger the child at the time of the abuse and the closer the relationship to the abuser, the less likely as an adult the individual will remember the abuse. Other children are often the perpetrators of child abuse especially if they have been abused themselves. Other signs of sexual abuse to watch out for? Workers who spend a large amount of time with kids or workers who prefer the company of children over adult relationships. Workers who will single out one child for special attention. Workers who spend money on other people's kids. Workers who own children's books or games or toys even though he or she has no children. Workers who spend a lot of time on the internet or workers who shun accountability. Look for these patterns of behavior because they are often recognizable signs of sexual abuse. How to report abuse while at camp. Remove child from immediate danger. Call 911 only if an extreme emergency exists. 
Immediately report abuse to the licensed youth camp operator. The licensed youth camp operator must call the Department of State Health Services. Complete an incident report form gathering as many details as possible. Church and parental notification will be the responsibility of the licensed youth camp operator. When reporting a suspected abuse, please remember the sensitive nature of this type of report and whenever possible, maintain the highest level of confidentiality. State law requires all citizens to report suspected abuse. The reporting agency in Texas is the Department of State Health Services. You do not have to give your name when you report child abuse. The child abuser cannot find out who reported them. Suspected abuse is sufficient reason to make a report to authorities. You do not need proof. Your call may make the difference in the very life of a child.